start with just a brief excerpt from scripture that we didn't hear in our reading today. This is a a brief excerpt from St. Paul's letter to St. Timothy. St. Paul warned St. Timothy that for the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but following their own desires and insatiable curiosity will accumulate teachers and will stop listening to the truth. And St. Paul says his solution to Timothy is this. Timothy, proclaim the word. Be persistent, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Convince, reprimand, and encourage through all patience and teaching. So false teachers are coming to spread error. St. Paul is urging Timothy to proclaim the word. We live in an era, I think, obviously, that is saturated, oversaturated, overflowing really with lies. The scriptures are full of the fact that Christ is the truth and that Satan, one of the major fruits of the evil one, is lies. He is the father of lies. What ought to disturb us, I think, and we've talked about this a little bit recently as well, is that the lies that are being perpetrated and spread in our own day, are getting closer and closer to the very heart of reality. The lies of our age are about what is and is not marriage. It's the very beginning of Genesis. God says this is super important what marriage is. That's the lies that are being spread today. The lies of our age are about masculinity and femininity and the belief that our gender is fluid and it is irrelevant. The lies of our age say that once you get past a certain age, you're no longer useful. You're less human. The lies of our age are about the humanity of a baby in the womb, and more recently, about babies actually born. And a lot of times, our temptation, and maybe even what we do, is to sit silently while the lies are spread. Sometimes we might excuse ourselves and say we live in an era of conscience and that we now never know what is right and what is wrong, and so I couldn't possibly speak prophetically because maybe what's true for me is not true for someone else. Sometimes we also excuse ourselves by saying, well, there needs to be good cops and bad cops. Some people need to speak boldly about the truth, and some need to be nuanced. I will calculatingly preach the truth quietly, if at all. The problem with that is that being prophetic is not like an interrogation room on law and order. We're not trying to coax a confession from a thief. We are all called to be prophetic. Not good prophets and bad prophets, not good cops and bad cops. All of us are asked to take the radical step of saying what is true saying it. On many fronts, of course, the challenge that we face in our own church is that on many fronts, those who've been ordained and asked to lead and shepherd and show how to do that, what it means to be a prophet, those who are supposed to help us learn and see that and find our own prophetic voice are themselves quiet. They're not able to denounce in any clear or prophetic way priests and bishops who harm children unable to denounce political leaders who say the most horrific things with their speeches, their votes, and their actions. We live in the most turbulent of times in the history of the church, and yet we see so much silence from within it. How? But although we lack that modeling from the leaders from within the church, the Word of God helps us today and shows us and teaches us. We go today to prophet school. In the first reading, God is pleading for prophets to come forward. Pleading. He says this, Stand up and tell them all that I command you. And God is also very upfront about what will happen. In the first reading today in prophet school, he says, They will fight against you, but they will not prevail over you. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. 
It's very hard saying what is true, calling a spade a spade. But the good news is, is that it does not hurt like you think it will. It does not hurt like you think it will. In the gospel, they come to throw Jesus over the cliff for what? Being a prophet. But it says a very beautiful thing. It says as, they, as the mob rushes at him, it says that he passed through their midst. And I would say that in my very imperfect ways, that has been my experience when mobs have run at me for trying to teach or say what the church teaches. It's interesting what happens. You're just sort of protected by God, and they can't really touch you in any real depth. It doesn't hurt like you're afraid that it will. You're sitting here maybe and thinking about the friends or the things that you need to say, but that you're also thinking about the people who will judge you and reject you and dismiss you, and it doesn't hurt, I promise. And I think that's one of the things that Jesus is saying. It's just missed. They can't touch you. I have lost really close friends and really close family by trying to stand up as often as I can once I found my voice and recognized the call that God is asking us to be prophets. I've lost lots of close friends and family. And it doesn't hurt nearly as much as I thought. And I think I started to realize what St. Paul meant when he said, I count all as loss compared to the power of knowing Jesus. It doesn't matter. Yes, there's a, it matters, but in the sense of when you compare it to Christ and living out your vocation and doing what Christ is asking, those things do not provide a counterbalance. They are not a compelling reason to ignore God. If you live and find your prophetic voice and speak and do the things and, and say the things that Christ is asking you to, if you speak the truth into the face of lies, you will lose the seats of honor at banquets and people will stop calling you by titles of honor. But that's exactly what Jesus said the Pharisees crave. That's the thing they crave. Seats of honor and titles. Jesus said his disciples would be despised and hated. Do people despise you? Do people hate you? Because of you speaking about the truth. Do people despise and hate you because of what you speak about Jesus Christ and his church? It's an examination of conscience for all of us striving to be prophets. Our final lesson today on being a prophet is in the second reading. St. Paul shows us the key to finding our prophetic voice, true, authentic love. Willing the good of the other, love for our neighbor and for God who calls us to this mission. We will never trust God until we love God. We will never say, I believe what you're saying, Lord, when you ask me to speak, when you ask me to live this way, when you ask me to be a prophet of truth in the face of lies. We will never trust him until we love him. And it is also authentic love that must be the engine behind this love of my neighbor. The only way that we can see someone living in the midst of lies and not say something is if we do not love them. I can then say, I will be quiet. You know why we can be quiet? Because I don't love them. If I love them, if I love my neighbor, then I can't help but say something. If I love my family member, if I love my whoever it is, my coworker, if I really love them, and I see them living in the midst of confusion and being led astray and being dragged down by lies which lead them to misery, then the only way I can hold my tongue is if I do not actually love them. We hear from St. Paul, love does not seek its own interest. It does not think, how can I preserve myself? It doesn't think that way. 
We say love, we hear love does not rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. So I think our question in our examination of conscience, do we love God? Do we trust God? Do we love our neighbor? If our answer to that is yes, then a clear response to both God and our neighbor is to speak the truth prophetically, to call lies lies, to call evil evil, and to call the truth the truth. Let us be prophets who are motivated by love. Anything less is ignoring God and abandoning our neighbor. Jesus tells us the only three words we need to hear in order to be prophets motivated by love. He begs us, be not afraid.